Hello and welcome everybody. In the previous videos we have seen some of the theory behind Markov chain Monte Carlo methods and because there was a lot of topics to discuss these videos were maybe a bit dry and to make up for this in this series of videos I want to show you an extensive example how we can use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And what I'll do is I'll use one of the traditional areas where Markov chain Monte Carlo methods are often employed, namely I will do an example from statistical inference. And the special application I want to consider here is the rise and fall of cases in the current COVID pandemic. And in particular I will try to analyze numbers which the UK government has provided about COVID death over the last months. And I'll see how we I will show you how we can use Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to get an estimate of the growth rates in the UK of that pandemic. So let me show you what I mean by that. So we are going to use a Markov chain Monte Carlo method, which means we can estimate expectations of the form of some function of some random variable using an estimator which looks like a standard Monte Carlo estimator, but where the samples xj are generated using the metropolis hastings algorithm and for the algorithm we need to pick a target density pi and for that to work we need to choose pi to be the density of x so that's the technical thing we have learned how to do and i also said we will use bayesian methods so let me remind you how bayesian parameter estimation works so in bayesian statistics the main new aspect is that the parameters are assumed to be random. So these parameters theta, they are distributed according say to some density p of theta. And this density measures either uncertainty or our previous knowledge about what theta may do that could in the easiest case just be a unit to home distribution on all valid values of theta. But in more complicated situations, maybe we have some previous knowledge that certain values of theta are more likely than others, though that could have some structure which reflects this previous knowledge. In either case, that is called the prior distribution of the parameters. Then using this parameter, observations are generated, and these come from some distribution which depends on theta. I write p theta here for the distribution of the data if theta is the parameter. So say that has the density p x given theta. So that's our data. Let me write that. So x observed data is little x, a sample from capital X. So and because of this setup where both theta and x are random, if we know x, we don't know theta exactly still because x is not a deterministic function of theta, but it is some random quantity where the distribution involves theta. So even if we know theta, there is extra randomness in x. And then going backwards, if we know x, we cannot completely determine theta, but we can learn something about theta. And that is the key of Bayesian inference, namely what we do is we consider the conditional distribution of theta given what we have just seen, so given that x is the observed data. And I said this, this is still random, even if we have observed x. And the distribution which goes with this is called the posterior distribution of theta. And normally that is more concentrated than the prior distribution, so the prior distribution somehow reflects all possible values of theta. And now we have learned something about theta. So it's still random, but it will incorporate the information we have learned. So typically that's a more concentrated distribution. And using this, we can then think what is the posterior mean, which is one way of getting an estimate for the parameters. And we can think what is the posterior variance, which is one way of saying what is the uncertainty of our estimate. And one could also ask related questions like what is the most likely value under the posterior distribution, which is what's called the MAP estimate, maximum a posteriori. And there are many other things you can do with this posterior distribution. So it tells us 
what range of values of theta is still possible after we've seen x equals x. What are the probabilities of these values? So we have a whole probability distribution which reflects uncertainty. Good. And the next question is, how do we get this posterior distribution? And that is what Bayes' formula does, namely the density of theta given we have seen x that equals, give you a short derivation, the so conditional density of x given y is defined as the joint density of x and y divided by the density of y. So that formula looks very much like the formula for conditional probabilities, but it is here written for densities. And using this logic, we get that thing equals the density of theta and x divided by the density of x. And if I apply the formula again, but now with x and theta swapped, then I can write that is the density of x given theta times the density of theta divided by the density of x. So I use this definition of the conditional density twice, once here in directly form I wrote here, and then joint density of theta and x, I can swap theta and x, and so for swapped theta and x I used it again, and this time the p, what's written p of y here, is multiplied to the other side, so the joint density is the conditional density times the density of the conditioning variable. So this equation is called Bayes' rule. So I pop that here. So let's look at these terms one by one. The first term here that tells us what do the observations do if we know theta. So that corresponds to this, this density, and that is given by our model. So we need a statistical model for our situation, but once we have this, that is part of the model, we know that. So we are good with this one. Then this here, we have already seen here, that is the prior distribution. That is again part of the modeling that describes our uncertainty about theta before we have gathered any data. And again, we will know about that from the model, so we are good here. The third term is a bit different, namely that is a derived term, that is the density of x, but this time not assuming we know what theta is. So here we need to allow for all possible things theta could have done, so that one can compute from the other two, that is p x given theta, but then we average over everything theta can do, and the correct weight is the density of theta d theta. So this is the formula, so in a sense we have this, but in practice that integral often cannot be solved and we just don't know p of x. So I put the x here, that is a problematic term. And the reason that we have this term here is the reason that often Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates are used in this context. Namely, if I write that as I did before, I write the unknown constant as 1 over z, so z is just p of x, and then I keep the other terms, density of x given theta times density of theta, and I call that pi of x. Then we are exactly in the situation we have discussed. Markov chain Monte Carlo methods can be used even if we don't know the constant in front, and we just need to know that function, but that function we said we are good with. So for some, for generating samples from the posterior distribution of theta, we can only use methods which don't require us to know the leading constant here, and the methods we learn for that kind of problem were envelope rejection sampling and Markov chain Monte Carlo, and here we are going to use Markov chain Monte Carlo. So this is the reason that Markov chain Monte Carlo methods are often used in Bayesian statistics to get a handle on the posterior distribution. So now let me run you through the application I will be considering. So the data I will be looking at will be about mortality of COVID-19 in the UK. And the UK government provides data on their webpage and there is different forms of data available. And what I will be looking here is the reported death per day. And even there, there is still a choice to be made. They report either the cases by date of death, when the person died, or when they got the number, so by date reported. And that's a bit later because there is a delay from the hospitals updating their record to the data actually reaching the central collection. So you could look at either one. The 
data which is given by date of death has a disadvantage that it is not up to date for the last two weeks or so because of these reporting delays, whereas the data I'm going to look at has a different disadvantage, namely fewer cases are reported on the weekends, so there are these periodic dips on the weekends. But we will deal with this, so let us see. The data, when we look at it in a second, will be time or date on the x-axis and deaths per day on the y-axis. And there was this first peak in spring. So here is March or April. And then things were relatively quiet over the summer. There were very low numbers. And then numbers started going up again. And there were two lockdowns. So the first lockdown took a while to filter through, but then led to the cases still going down again here. And now we are in the second lockdown, and hopefully that leads to a similar decay in cases very soon from now. Good, but the data does not actually look like this curve I drew, but the data is scattered around this curve. And what typically happens is that there are two values every week which correspond to Saturday and Sunday, where the values reported are much, much lower. And then the following Monday is a bit higher because on the weekend fewer cases are reported and cases just pile up and are then reported on the next day. And there is an extra day of delay, so actually in the data we will be looking at that will show as low values on Sunday and Monday and then high values on Tuesday. And on top of this there is quite a bit of fluctuation, even ignoring the weekends. So what I want to do is I want to go from the noisy data to this line and I want to get a sense what is this line and in particular I want to get a sense of what are the growth or decay rates. So how could I do that? If we just go back here we see theta is the unknown quantity, x is the data. So x must be the reported numbers and theta somehow must be the line I'm after. So I first need to somehow encode the line in a bunch of parameters which I then will use for my theta. What I plan to do is I plan to do curves which piecewise look like a times e to the lambda t, where t is time. And if lambda is positive, the curves will be going up. And if lambda is negative, you know how exponential functions work, then the curve will be going down. I stitch these together, so for the peak, for example, we could have a stretch where it goes up, followed by a stretch where it goes down. And to parameterize this, what I need is I need times where I connect these pieces and I need values which are the value of the curve at the connection points. And here I want the curve to be continuous just because when we look at the data we will see the curve for the data looks pretty continuous. So parameters are first these times and t0, t1 up to tk minus 1 and then tk. So I take k plus 1 breakpoints so that I have k intervals. And the first one, I write start of pandemic, there I will take the first point where we have data. And the last one I will take as today, or rather yesterday, because today's data is not yet out. So these are fixed, but these here are unknown, so that is part of what I want to encode in my theta. And these should correspond to points where the rate of increase or decrease changes, so the first peak and hopefully second peak should be candidates for that. And then I said this, we need values a0, a1, a k minus 1, and a k to go with these peaks, and these are all unknown and need to be estimated. So the unknown values, if I collect them all, that is t1 up to t k minus 1. And for the values, I also need the boundary points. Even if I know when I start, I don't know what the value there is. So I take a0 to a k, and that is a vector of size we count k minus 1 plus k plus 1, so it's 2k. For each interval I have two numbers. So that will be my theta. We will need to think later about what do we use for the prior distribution on theta. Then from theta we get in the way I just sketched this curve. So let's call that lambda of t. That is meant to be the continuous curve for the exponential growth segments. And t ranges from t0 to tk. And then I need to say what is x. So my observation is x. x is reported death for each day in the interval t0 up to tk. 
And again, we need to make a model, so we need to say what is the distribution of death given we know the parameters. So we need to answer for a given shape of the curve, a hypothetical shape, one that could be. We need to be able to say what's the distribution of x. And both of these are modeling assumptions, and if we were going to do this for real, the first step would probably be to talk to an epidemiologist, because I myself don't know much of these matters. So let's do something simple here, but let's keep in our minds that will not give results which actually can be used to make inference about the real pandemic, because you would need more know-how, and also I take some shortcuts later. But what we are going to do here is we are going to learn about Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, and we can certainly do that, and we can get a glimpse on how things could be done properly. So we need first a prior on the shape of these curves, where we need to say what's the distribution of the points where we stitch together our segments, and then we need to say what is the distribution of the values at these points. And that is one thing, I'll talk a bit about this later, and then we need to also say what is the distribution of x if we know the curve, and I want to just do a relatively simple thing here, and want to write that already, so we assume, given theta, that xt is Poisson distributed with mean lambda theta of t. And then x is just all of them glued together. So x is then xt, where t is in t0, t0 plus 1 up to tk. And I will assume these are independent. And you see already I simplified quite a bit here. So first the question is, is Poisson distribution really a realistic assumption? And even if we have this, I told you already, values are underreported on weekends and then higher on the day after. So we are not capturing this here. So the two values are not really independent because the underreported values show up at some point. And also we would need to do some clever thing for the weekends. But again, we are learning about the method, so let's not bother here. And we will see we still will get reasonable results. Okay, so with this, we have settled the theory behind what we are going to do. And in the next video, I'll start implementation in R. So see you in the next video.